Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who is coming in Bethlehem in mere days. As we celebrate now our fourth Sunday of Advent, again, we welcome all of you into the sanctuary of the Lord this morning. If you're joining us online, we welcome you. Wherever you are joining us from, you are part of this community. You are welcome. If you would, uh, find one of those friendship pads, welcome pads, somewhere along your row, and let us know you're here, especially if you're visiting with us uh, for the first time. We would love to know uh, that you're here and that you are worshiping with us. And if you are online, drop down in the comment box and let us know you're here. And uh, we are glad to welcome you. On Wednesday evening, December the 21st at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary, we will be having our longest night of the year or so-called Blue Christmas service. And uh, you are welcome to come into this space. Blue Christmas uh, is celebrated on the longest night of the year when there is the most darkness. Uh, it is a quiet time of prayer and reflection and meditation, candle lighting, as we recognize that Christmas is not joyful for everyone. Uh, we are all bearing burdens, and some of those get quite heavy at Christmas. And so we invite you to come into this space and to unburden yourself with the encouragement of the, of the congregation and before Almighty God. So that is December the 21st, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Also, because of that and the, uh, and the Christmas holiday, we will not have any more Bible studies this year. Our Wednesday night and our Thursday, night, uh, Bible, our Thursday morning Bible study will be on hiatus until the first week of January. So we want to uh, be sure you know that. And finally, if you have uh, a poinsettia that you have given in honor or memory of someone and you would like to take that with you, Today is a day you can do that. If you would like to leave the poinsettia, uh, we will share what are those that are left with our homebound population. And so feel free to take it home if you would like to, but also feel free to leave it and know that you will bear the light of Christ and the love of God in these beautiful flowers to those in need. Um, Susan, I believe you have an announcement, and then we will proceed with worship. All right, quick, quick show of hands. How many of you know we have staff to serve this church? Yeah? All right. Uh, another show of hands. How many of you appreciate what that staff does for this church? All right. Well, I have an opportunity for you. Um, to show your appreciation, you can contribute towards our staff love offering. You have two days left, two shopping days left, to get your money in. Uh, but we're... Uh, the Staff Parish Relations Committee is getting everybody to, to pool their money, and we will give it to our, our fine staff who has served us so well, and so we invite you to do that. Just make sure that you put staff love offering on the memo line of the check, or if you do it online in the other box where you can identify what it's for, um, and you can put it in the offering plate or in the lock box, or again, online. So, thank you.
Please stand as you are able for the greeting. The coming light fills our vision. God is coming for us. The long journey is ending. The opening hymn is Love Came Down at Christmas, number 242 in your hymnals. Isaiah said that the Lord spoke to the king and said, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as shell or high as heaven. But when the king refused, God would not be stopped. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. God wants us to know, even when we aren't sure of ourselves, God wants us to experience God's presence, even when we think we can handle life on our own. God sends us signs of God's presence with us. All we need to do is keep our eyes open and look. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she bore a son, and he named him Jesus. We light these candles, a candle of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, of deep everlasting joy, and today pre presence that speaks of love as a sign that no matter our circumstance, we know we are not alone. You may be seated. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear them, O house of David, 
Is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are now in dread will be deserted. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We have an anthem about this time, but unfortunately a lot of our choir members are ill today. And so uh, we are in prayer for them, and some of you are out in the uh, congregation, and we hope you're well, And uh, but uh, in the interest of keeping everyone safe, uh, Anthony and I decided we would not have practice on Thursday, And uh, but we hope for good health for everyone uh, in the near future. I'm going to ask the children to just stay right where you are, uh, where, wherever you are sitting, because it would be a great disturbance to come up front here, so, uh, but I'm talking to, to the young people here. And let me ask you something, especially these two here. See, they, these, are my, these are my regular buddies here. But, uh, but uh, do you love something? If somebody says, what do you love? Can you just call out something? What do you love? Who loves ice cream? Yeah, is that good? Yeah. Who loves... Yeah, getting getting better now, right? Getting better. Who loves your mom and dad? Yeah. Grandma, granddad. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna fool you. Who loves sisters? Do you, do you, lo- you love your sisters? Yeah. Yeah. My my son is 24, my daughter is 22, and all my sons talk about coming home for Christmas is to see his sister. Now, she doesn't feel the same way about him, but that's a whole nother story. But, uh, but yeah, we love things. We love all kinds of things, and it's good to love. But today, we lit a candle, the fourth candle on our Advent wreath, and I don't know if you can see it, but it says love on the side. And on, when we talk about love, here we're talking about a particular kind of love. The love that God has for every person here. And we see the evidence of that in the birth of Jesus Christ. We can know that God loves us when we see Jesus. When we know that the love of God comes into the world in Bethlehem. So while we will love our brothers and our sisters and chocolate and all of that stuff, ice cream too, let's not forget ice cream. Uh, We most find love in remembering that God loves us. So if you ever wonder, does anybody love you? No, God does. And all we have to do is look at Jesus being born into the world to see evidence of that. All right, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for loving us and we thank you for sending us Jesus. We love you, God, always and forever. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. Find this text in the first chapter, beginning in the 18th verse. So hear now a living word of God for a living people in love with God. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When uh, When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. 
But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place uh, to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but he had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. This is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. Friends, I invite you to pray with me. Holy Lord, descend your spirit into this place and fill this space with your loving presence. As your word is proclaimed, walk among us. Fill us with your truth. Touch us with your light. Lord, we are gathered here. We are listening. We are eager for what you have to say to us. So, Lord, let no one leave here unchanged. After the proclamation of your word, after the worship, of you, O Lord. Let no person leave here unchanged. Speak now, for your servants are gathered, we are listening. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Matthew and Luke are the only places in Scripture giving us a narrative of Jesus' birth. And while both recount this same wondrous event, Matthew and Luke do it in very different ways. We often gather both renditions and mix them so that we get shepherds and magi together at the manger, even on the same night. We conveniently forget that Luke gives us the shepherds and Matthew gives us the magi. And most don't even believe that the magi arrive until Jesus is two years old, maybe even a little older. We ought not to make more of these differences than necessary. After all, the big event, Jesus' birth, still occurs. But these differences do communicate nuances that help us navigate what radio man Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story. Now, these differences are apparent even before Jesus is born. Notice how the news of Jesus' upcoming birth is communicated to Mary and Joseph. Both are visited separately by angels giving them this joyful, if perplexing, news. Mary will sing a song of praise in response. Joseph is given instruction on what to name the baby born in Bethlehem. But both are called by God to obey under very difficult circumstances. And we do marvel at their willingness. Yet both have very different reasons for being obedient. Mary is desperate. Her options are limited. This is not to minimize the depth of her faith. I'm not saying for a moment that Mary's decision to obey God under such trying circumstances, was an easy decision for her. But as I preached last week, Mary has faith in God because God is all that she has. She sings a song of hope from a weary throat because God gives hope to the weary. Now, Joseph is different. He has options. Joseph is fully within his rights to dismiss what appears to be an unfaithful betrothed. He has no further obligations to marry if he chooses to be done with his relationship with her. He can move on and build a new life with a different wife, and no one will think 
a bit less of him for doing so. In fact, all of Joseph's family and friends will, will expect him to cast Mary to the side. They will praise Joseph for doing what is appropriate, even the righteous thing under the law. Even now, not bound by the tenets of that law and living in a vastly changed world with changed moral restrictions, most of us here find it difficult to condemn Joseph if he chooses to dismiss his young-to-be wife. And yet, Joseph surprises us. He doesn't assert his right. Joseph is a religious man who keeps his faith secure by valuing the law, but here Joseph does not accept what the law allows him to take. He knows God is mysteriously giving more. He hears an angel bearing news from heaven. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph receives instruction. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus. And this man, Joseph, son of David, is given hope for what what will lie ahead. For this child will save his people from their sins. And receiving this radically good news, Joseph takes a path that few others would. Joseph sacrifices the easy way of the law to walk the incredibly hard path of grace. Simply put, Joseph chooses love. Joseph chooses love. Now, love has become a rather overused term in our day. Its meaning has become thin. Love is often what we will make of it. It is in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. More often than not, these days, it has become little more than sentimental mush. We frequently set aside complex debates in favor of saying, well, we just need to love everybody. We just need to love everybody. Our theology is dictated more by the sweet notes of Someone like Burt Bacharach singing, What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Then it is by the challenging call of Jesus' gospel. We certainly do need to love everyone, but what does it mean? Can we do this? What does it mean to follow Jesus saying to us, Love your enemies? For if you love those who love you, what what reward do you have? Do we believe in love like Jesus does when he looks down from a cross and prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Are we able to even love like Jesus when after he is resurrected, he returns to breathe peace on those who were closest to him, but also those who had abandoned him? in his hour of maximum peril. Love looks different when it costs something. It looks different. Love will always place particular challenges before us and specific obligations upon us. This sort of love is a struggle. And I'm sure because it is a struggle that Joseph doesn't make a quick decision about Mary. Remember, Joseph was a righteous man. He wanted to keep the rules. He demanded accountability to the law. He possessed a strong sense of the difference between right and wrong. And we also think of ourselves as upright, moral, good people. We like to also keep the rules. We want accountability from others. We are good at coloring in between the lines. Doing so gives us a sense of control. Our lives are more predictable that way. Our lives have a certain logic to it when we live within the rules. We don't have to think too much. We don't have to think too much following rules. 
And even when we believe others are not following our rules, well, we will find some way to get along. We will find a way to live with our differences. But is it love? Is it love? Most of the time, we will settle for human tolerance instead of godly love. Do what you want. I will not judge you, at least out loud, I won't judge you. But why don't you go and do that over there? Ah, away from me, where I do not have to see you doing it. Yes, we will easily welcome tolerance over challenging life of love together. But I'm afraid that the Christian gospel the good news of Christ, well, it doesn't let us off the hook that easy. We are called as followers of Jesus to dive into wilder waters. We wade into water that God troubles. We navigate the rapids of real life without the stability we all crave. Baptism into the living waters of what that Christ gives, well, that's not for the faint of heart. It is for those who are ready for a life-giving adventure, taking us to places where we will certainly be uncomfortable, to do things that we feel like we cannot do, to live life with people who we would rather not be around. Loving others, holding them close, living life together will take us to where we never expected to go, even wanted to go, but we follow Jesus, and we go where he goes. We go where Jesus sends. That is our call. Following Christ in that manner means looking to Joseph as an example. Now, Joseph surely doesn't get much attention in the life story of Jesus. He appears here early in the birth narrative, more in Matthew than in Luke, but is only casually mentioned again throughout the whole of the New Testament. And yet, he is, I believe, a paragon of faith because he makes the difficult choice to love as God first loved us. He takes Mary as his wife. He provides for a son that is not his own. He gives up the letter of the law to live its true meaning. He is an example of holy love, and that means something to us Christians, particularly those of us from the Wesleyan tradition. John Wesley thought love without holiness was meaningless. And so theologian Kenneth Collins explains that holiness must ever be understood in terms of divine love and a love that is energized in a freely chosen outward movement that stoops down, as it were, and draws the relation, makes contact, and establishes fellowship. That's what holy love does. It draws us into relationship, makes contact, establishes fellowship. Holy love, to say it another way, just brings us together. Holy love is expressed in relationship, or it is not expressed at all. Holy love says that even when the world says it is okay to be apart, stay together. No, it will not be easy. But was Christ coming into the world, dying on a cross, being resurrected from the dead, returning to fulfill God's will one day, was that easy? Joseph has resolved to dismiss Mary. Everyone would have understood, approved, yes, he is a good man after all. What choice does he have? God showed up and gave him one. I wonder how God is going to intervene in our own time. How is God going to bring about a church known for its love not only of God, but also a love for each other? The earliest Christian communities had little agreement on theology. 
They were not of one mind about doctrine. They didn't interpret Scripture the same way. There was not even agreed upon canon at this time. There wasn't even a Bible. But these communities and those in them were known for spending time together, for eating meals at the same table, for sharing what they had, fellowshipping with one another. In fact, the very first crisis to face the new church was not over any sort of disagreement of a belief, or a doctrinal crisis. Instead, it was focused on what early Christians were doing. The Greek widows were not receiving their fair share of food. And so the new church appointed seven men to attend to such work. Holy love was the tie that bound the church into a community of care and a fellowship of love. Everyone certainly didn't believe the same thing. But the early church, in the early church, everyone had something to eat. Everyone was seen. Everyone was invited. All were included. No, no, don't, don't, don't you sit over there. Why don't you come sit with me, they said to one another. And I just wonder, can we be that sort of church again? that the sort of church we want to build together? Another way to describe holy love is by the Greek word agape. The Greeks had four main concepts for love. Eros is, of course, romantic love. Philia is the love between family and friends. Storge describes the love between parents and a child. But agape is different. Agape is a holy sort of love because it is a way of loving others as God loves us. Martin Luther King Jr. called agape the highest form of love, and he preached that when we rise to love on the agape level, we love persons not because we like them, not because their attitudes and ways appeal to us, but we love them because God loves them. We bear each other's burdens. We sacrifice for each other. We notice others. We even bleed for them if necessary because God gives us Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, born of a woman in a manger in Bethlehem, later to die on a cross in Jerusalem, buried in a grave three days later, you know the rest of the story now. God is with us. Glory to God. Amen. Have you heard the word proclaimed? I invite you now to stand as we profess together what it is we believe using the Apostles' Creed on page 881 of your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
And as we have heard the word proclaimed, as we feel the presence of Christ surrounding us and bringing us together, we now pray to holy God, knowing that that God will listen to us, cares for us, is attentive to us. So let us enter into a posture and an attitude of prayer. Let us pray. God Almighty, you are love, holy love. Your attention and grace is what gives us life and is what gives that life meaning. From the very first, you have showed the patience of holy love. You dismissed Adam and Eve from the Garden of Plenty, but you stitched together clothes to protect them in the outside world. In the flood of Noah's time, you brought about accountability for sin, but you paved a path of restoration. When Israel herself was rebellious, you sent them through a wilderness into exile, but then you returned them through that same wilderness, you made a highway home. And as time turned, you gave yourself to us in a baby born in Bethlehem. Love came close again. Love will never leave us. God of precious love, we call your attention to the suffering of the world, but we do it with the knowledge that you are already aware you have already noticed. You know the afflictions of suffered by so many. We pray for loved ones who are sick and for those who we do not know by name but who fill hospital beds all over this nation. We pray for the people of Peru who are facing frightening political violence. We pray for our neighbors in Ukraine, still under assault. We pray for those in places that we are unaware of, but where on this day people do suffer, where conflict continues, where peace is a stranger, where love seems to have no friends. Generous and loving God, as the light of Christmas grows bright among us, may your love be shared. And as we share that love with you, give us the encouragement and strength to share it with those among us. May the light of Christmas be a beacon of invitation and a banner of welcome to those who seek to know you. You have welcomed all of us in grace and love. May we do the same to strangers who will become our friends, the lonely who will be given the promise of togetherness, and the vulnerable who will be protected in our midst. Let love animate our lives and draw us closer to you and to one another. Now, holy God, bless us as we enter into this Christmas week. May the preparation we have done in Advent blossom and bloom as we witness your wondrous love come close in the humbleness of the manger. Come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord, in whose precious name we pray the prayer that he gives us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we do experience the presence of a loving Savior, that loving Savior will bring us peace. And so in acknowledgement of his holy presence, in acknowledgement of our hope for one another, I urge you to stand and offer each other this sign, the peace of Christ with you. And also with all of you online, the peace of Christ be with you. Please stand and offer signs of Christ's peace.
may be seated. We bring our whole selves into worship, and we offer our whole beings to God when we enter into the sanctuary. Each week we are invited to offer financial giving, financial generosity to God and to this church for its mission, for its ministry, for all the light that it bears into the community. And so I would ask you to prayerfully give generously. If you do not give here and give online, we appreciate it. But in whatever you do, whatever you give, know that you will glorify God and you will bless this church.
Lord God, as we stand here in the glow of this Advent wreath, as that glow grows brighter with each passing day and we anticipate the lighting of the Christ candle with the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, receive these gifts, reflect on them your generosity, your pure love, your abundant giving. Help us have the wisdom to use this wisely for your glory. Multiply and magnify these gifts as we seek to do your will on this earth as Jesus comes into it. We give you thanks, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. I ask you to remain standing for our last hymn, number 245 in your hymnals, the first Noel, and we will have a living nativity here as, as they come forward during the, the uh, singing of this last hymn, number 245, the first Noel.
Indeed, the light of Christ is coming into the world. It gives us hope. It brings us salvation. It is God's love. Look around you, and you can see it. You can feel it. You can experience it. So go, let this light go with you. Take it with you wherever you go. Share it with whomever you encounter. Go with the love of the Father and the grace of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.